Thank you. Um, we all have a lot of room up here, so. Um, <laughs> one of the things that, just from listening to all of your talks, um, really where we want to go is if you're not part of a learning healthcare system as a clinician, a health system, or a patient, then you feel angry or left out. That's an aspirational goal. Can we agree on that? Um, I can't help but thinking of the analogy, um, uh, Gray, after listening to your talk about um, how uh, the GM um, ignition system played out where it was a very simple fix. The data was available that this was a failure um, and people lost their lives, but yet um, the, from an organizational perspective, a change couldn't be made. And that, that there's an analogy uh, with healthcare in that, that we often know about harms or have a, 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 um, an inkling of a harm, but we don't know as, as providers or a healthcare system how to change that and how to fix that. And that um, a learning healthcare system is, is a way to actually speed that development of learning from things that, that bad things happen, but also to pick up good things that um, we may not have been aware of before and, and disseminating and implementing those findings quickly. Um, we are now in the discussion, the Q&A phase. Um, I'd love to have some questions from the floor. Um, if you would just raise your hand so I can see you and uh, recognize you. John. This is a webinar, so please identify yourself and speak into the mic. Thanks. Yeah, I actually need to identify myself anyhow because I was not here yesterday. Hi, I'm John White. I'm from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, thank you all for coming. I heard about uh, yesterday's proceedings, and it sounds like spot on. Uh, everybody is giving the discussion that's needed, so thank you. Appreciate that. Um, uh, this is a question actually for Peter Knox. Uh, all the talks are excellent. Um, and Peter, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> this is just where my microphone is. Um, um, uh, so uh, it, it, you gave a, a actually fascinating uh, discussion about how the leadership and organization of a system moves towards uh, you know delivering better value. And you know I was noodling over the number you said every for two hours every week the the C suite meets, and you know, I just did some quick math in my head, and you know that means you've got to be spending you know, at least a quarter of a million dollars a year on, you know, managing the energy of the organization at that level, which is great, and it's producing results for you. Um, tell me about, what, and you kind of touched on it, but you didn't quite get to it. Tell me a little bit more about the resources in dollars that a system needs to invest in uh, a, 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 a system of information, which I know you guys are collecting now about you know, processes that are happening in your system. But what are the resources that you invest in getting that information? Because that's really, you know, I think what folks are talking about. And I, I, I think you probably know more about that. I just want to hear more about it. We. Um Strategically, what, what we're talking about is um, building a knowledge brain. We call it the brain. Um, we think that the brain has to operate at three levels of knowledge. Um, there's a strategic level um, to the brain that um, allows us to look at populations and um, understand populations kind of at a macro directional level and, and develop strategy. Um, the second level of the brain um, is what John Whittington calls the mezzanine level, you know, the registry level uh, of the brain. And we're, um, when we work with employers, our, our, our value proposition is to work with them uh, in a non-narrow network to help them accomplish the triple aim. So we're taking on accountability for a population uh, that doesn't necessarily come to our system. So that brain has to operate outside the boundaries of our, our system. So building that mezzanine level. And the third level of the brain is point of care, which is uh, giving the, uh, the, the care team and the providers information on the ground when they're in front of a patient. Um, so we're working with different partners uh, to create that, that brain and develop out all three levels um, at the probably at the core of our our platform is Epic, 
and you know our investment we're a billion dollar organization so we're you know relatively small i guess in terms of the uh, number of people in the room <clears throat> but i think we you know we've invested 30 million in um in epic for our base platform we're working with a partner called cryptic to help us build out um uh, the, the two levels of the brain, the strategic and the mezzanine level, and, and actually point of care. So we want that information where it's appropriate to travel down. We're a development partner with Cryptic in developing that. So uh, we're investing dollars uh, with them to develop that product that they hopefully can use with other individuals. And we're working with other partners to um, help us develop that, 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 full, that full brain. So our our investment is uh, significant for an organization our size, but we're very intentional about what we're trying to build. Uh, we have a group of, of physicians along with um, groups we've been working with nationally to develop the specifications for that brain. So at every level, we've defined very clear specifications on what we need that level to do. And we're working with partners to help us deliver on those specifications. And then Fairly important is that uh, it's embedded in Epic, um, so that strategic level data is embedded if it needs to travel down to the point of care. So, and then if that answers your question in terms of our investment and what we're trying to create. Thank you. Uh, kind of a twofold, uh, Jim Rohack from uh, Baylor Scott and White. Um, a question to Peter uh, and also a question to Bray. So one of the concerns about the payment methodologies that have been set up by showing that you're two thousand dollars less in providing payment or providing the resources is next year's contract will start that as the baseline and then you're gonna have to show continued improvement off that. So so it gets back to the issue of then how do you invest in technology because the individual patient, getting back to Bray, uh, when you have a rare disease, many times you are going to be searching for that uh, system that's invested in the laser uh, closure device that's uh, only available like transcatheter aortic valve replacement, um, and with the expectation that technology is going to be able to solve all the problems. So how? I'd like to kind of hear how does one balance providing um, uh, a, a fixed dollar amount, uh, effective, efficient organization with the balance that uh, if you invest in technology, sometimes technology doesn't work, uh, yet patients with cancer being a, a good example, you go to cancer centers because they do have the latest and greatest, they're the focus factories, and that's challenging for community systems to provide those other resources that are needed for that community. So a little discussion about that would be helpful. So I think you raised something that's a, it's a good, um, it's a good challenge for all of us to think through, and I, I think about um, Dr. Redberg's talk yesterday about, you know, we have these new guidelines for care, which essentially is that less care is better for the patient. But I think because the trust didn't already exist um, and that there was probably question of, you know, what are the perverse financial incentives, um, that the patient community basically rejected that. So I would surmise that if you have a partnership with a patient community um, or even, a, a, you know, a patient group that can say this is the best model of care, um, a lot of times patients are uncomfortable with doing nothing or doing less. And so if you really don't have somebody that patients trust saying, this is what, you know, we understand that you're practicing, uh, or your practice is evidence-based, um, we think this is the best. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, direct-to-consumer or patients online that actually will have whatever, you know, the laser is and they think it's great and then they go tell all their friends when really it's not evidence-based at all. And if you don't have, um, I guess, you know, the other party that there's trust in, then I think you know, you're, you're vulnerable to exactly what you're describing. And the payment piece here, I mean, you're absolutely right. I and mean, we're having discussions with um, all of our, our payers. And I think the, you know, the question with Pioneer, I mean, use that as an example. Um, year two, we're, uh, you know, into year two, almost to the end. Uh, we're, we're on the bubble for shared savings this year because of the things you mentioned. 
uh, we do believe with things we're doing, uh, we can uh, achieve a shared savings again in year th three. Um, we've talked openly um, internally about whether we continue with the program the way it's designed. Um, but we do believe that we have a good partner in uh, CMS, CMMI, who's willing to have those discussions with us. And that's, that's what we're looking for right now. We're looking for good partners who, will, who are willing to talk to us, willing to uh, listen and work with us to design um, mutual benefit. Um, the, the question I think that we're faced with is, uh, do we continue to move up the risk continuum and enter into uh, essentially fully capitated full risk contracts? And we will be launching our first um, uh, full, fully capitated product into the market in the small group in 15. So we, we do believe uh, that for us there's a short shelf life for shared savings and that we have to move into that full risk uh, arena. Um, and regarding that technology question, you know, first and foremost, um, this is about value creation. And I think the, the questions that we're trying to ask, sometimes not always successfully, up front is truly what is, what is the patient need? What do they truly want? And, and that requires us many times to um, go into their homes and have hour -long discuss multiple hour-long discussions around needs with with patients to truly understand the need, i.e. That, that cancer example I, I talked about. And then uh, looking at value, and we've invested heavily in robotic technology because we think it adds value. We've made decisions not to do other things because we don't think it adds value. In other areas, uh, we look to partners who have that uh, technology that an organization like ours um, might or won't invest in. So that, it, for us, it keeps coming back to that value equation. Rachel, you had your hand up. Um, you have to use the microphone, please. Uh, one of the things that, that I keep coming back to. Can you oh, I'm sorry. Question? This is Rachel Hess. I'm from the PATH CDRN network out of Pittsburgh. Um, with our partners in Pennsylvania and Maryland. Um, one of the questions that I come back to throughout these discussions, and it was brought home a little bit with um, Peter and Bray's discussion today, and is, is one of evidence and evidence quality and speed. Um, and I'm taken back to um, something that happened between uh, the end of 2007 and the beginning of 2008 when um, new guidelines came out for breast cancer patients undergoing treatment, that radiation after mammography um, had an absolute mortality reduction of somewhere around 4%, um, which is great and really good and, and something that should be applied. And in that same time, uh, there was also a belief from the best data that we had that epigen was, was good for, for patients with breast cancer. And it, um, improved, it increased the red blood cell count and allowed them to stay on their chemo regimens. Right around January or February of 2008, a very small trial that was supposed to prove this definitively released their initial data and actually showed about a 4% absolute increase in mortality for breast cancer patients receiving epigen, which pretty much was the same as radiation, right? So we had this data that said 4% increase benefit with a 4% increased harm. And good cancer centers had rapidly implemented radiation guidelines. They had also rapidly implemented these epigen guidelines and took a few weeks to react to the trial data that was coming out to implement the reverse epigen guidelines. Mm -hmm. But in that few weeks, probably gave epigen to a number of women who had an absolute increase in mortality in between the time that the original sort of preliminary data was released and the FDA could digest it and then the cancer centers could digest it. And so one of the things that I think about in this continuously learning health system and providing best evidence for patients is the speed at which we disseminate. And the researcher in me says, you know, 
how quickly do we how quickly do we implement how, how quickly do we implement things and when do we feel bad about not implementing them we feel great when we don't implement something quickly and it turns out to be harmful we feel awful when we when we don't implement something that turns out to be beneficial and i guess i'd like a little bit of reaction from the from that perspective of engaging stakeholders when we start to think about caution and when sometimes caution is right and sometimes caution is wrong and how do we maintain that relationship in in those times So um, you bring up a point that patients struggle with every day, which is the information that is getting out. What do we do with it? What, is it meaningful? When you set a small trial, I'm wondering, you know, was it design? Was it large enough to change practice? I also think about what's the role of peer review? So, um, you know, there is a role for peer review. It doesn't need to take an eternity, but there's still a role for peer review. But in, in the breast cancer community, there's a, a very um, sophisticated um, group, the National Breast Cancer Coalition. And I would ask, you know, run that evidence by them and see what they think. Um, how should it have been, you know, reacted to and, and what do you do? Um, you know, we have patient reps that are serving on advisory committees at FDA, um, reviewing grants at DOD, certainly involved in PCORI. And, um, and you really struggle with that evidence. I've been on FDA panels where at the end of it, uh, you may not be very popular and you struggle, you know, with what's the right thing to do. And I think buy-in from the patient community about how to react could be beneficial there. I guess the comment I wanted to make is one of the advantages of having large groups of people engaged in standardized processes that when there are competing views about what to do, uh, when uh, everyone is uh, participating, we can be intentional about, about actually uh, mounting the studies that we need to mount to answer the questions um, and can get to that point much more quickly. Um, so uh, to me, the, the engagement provides a, a solid foundation for uh, additional research in which everybody is actually actively involved, cooperating, collecting the data, and uh, planning on implementing the results once they once it comes back. So I wanted to add to that briefly to say I, I will say yesterday I'm I'm a huge fan of Susan Wang and um, she probably doesn't even know that I love her work, but listening to her talk about you know the nine month period of time before um, peer reviewed publication with the the MRSA data. Uh, it was pretty horrifying. I mean, that is way too long. That seemed like a, a you know a no-brainer. Why did we have to wait as patients and let other people get infections? Like, so I think there is going to be um, maybe a sweet spot that's achieved through some of our work at Picornet. Just a just a quick comment to that because I I think it's um, important and I I think I, I would um, refer back to Dr. James yesterday and creating that infrastructure and that's that's what I try and do create that infrastructure that cascades down through the organization. So we, we do what I talked about at the system level, but that cascades down into our service lines, our teams, and then down to the, the individual. And I think what we've tried to do is create the environment. The, the discipline in, in my study of uh, execution uh, around the world, really, in successful organizations, there really is a, a rhythm to it. So um, in your example at our cancer team, they would have um, their plan put together. They'd be in a rhythm of 120-day cycles. They would be taking that sort of information with patients sitting with them and having those discussions. And that's where they would wrestle with priorities related to them and, and, and their work and be prioritizing and making those decisions. It's, are there perfect answers to that? No, but can we create the infrastructure and structure and the rhythm and discipline within our organizations where important topics are on the agenda and being talked about um, on a regular, regular basis. So we've got a queue. Hal, Paul. Um, it, Hal Left Palo Alto Medical Foundation Research Institute. I'm I'm struck in this discussion, which I think is absolutely wonderful and fascinating, about how we may be stuck on the term. And evidence based. Because I think for, for many of us, uh, that means it has gone through peer reviewed trials, hard evidence, Cochrane review type stuff. And yet, when I listen to Peter Knox, Bellin is very evidence based. 
and probably very little of that is done with RCTs and peer review and things of that sort. Um, traditionally, I think physicians sometimes talked about empiric practice, um, which sort of meant I'm going to go in my gut. Uh, because there's no evidence out there. And then evidence base got picked up as, well, it ought to be out of research. But when I think about the speed with which practice changes, the speed with which new technology becomes available, and then also the, if we're really going to look at how patients value things, what they value are often not the endpoints that are easily measured. Um, and so I'm wondering whether either a, um, resurrection of empiric based medicine uh, to mean something like you decide what you're going to do with the patient, you measure it, you report on it, that data gets collected in varying ways to build the evidence base much, much more rapidly. Um, we're living in a world where right now what we do is something like the every five year new editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, when in fact we ought to be doing something like Wikipedia. And then I'm interested in your, con in your observations on all of that. Clay, um, back in 11, spent a year at IHI as a senior fellow and worked a lot with Tom Nolan uh, on that, I think, notion of testing with one patient and scale up. Um, so I, um, I have to agree. I, you know, there are, there are things that I think require that intense research. Um, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, on other things, at least in our organization, I know I'm, I'm working with our women's service line to redesign the experience for women completely based upon feedback we've gotten from them. And um, we're testing with uh, some things with five patients, recording, and then adjusting and, and scaling up from there. Um, so I think there is, a, a, personally, I think there's a lot to what you're saying. And I think there, there's good work out there from Tom Nolan and others in terms of uh, an approach to that. So. <clears throat> I'm Paul Wallace from Optimal Labs. This is really great for, um, I think it, it reflects exemplars who have been doing a variety of things. One of our challenges as we think about national agendas is that how do we take the experience of the exemplars and extend it more broadly? And so when we think about the research agenda, um, on some level, there, there are going to be things that just have to be done locally. But in order to create capacity to do things locally, we've got to figure out what are the things that could and should be done on scale. And I'm just wondering from, you know, you, you've all thought about how to spread what you're doing. Um, and how do, we, how do we do this in a way that we actually do begin to float more votes? Um, you know, and we, we tend to keep emphasizing and putting a lot of resource into the exemplars without necessarily figuring out, to Peter's example, you know, what is our national agenda to be sure that we focused on the folks that actually are below the middle? Um, because there's an awful lot of people that are receiving care below the middle. And I guess the last comment would be, too, patients move between geographies. Um, and we create local excellence. But how do we actually create a patient path that ensures that they're always going to receive excellence when people cross, which I think is part of the reason that we have to think about this to some degree, at least, as a national agenda. So I'm curious where you think about how the agenda sorts out. Are those things that have to be done, have to be done locally, but where do we create the capacity to do that by having some scaled economies? I, I, I just want to build on Hal's um, concept of how, to, how Wikipedia works. So um, I, I think PCORNet actually has a tremendous opportunity to work sort of like Wikipedia works, where um, we can expand dramatically the capacity that we have. The way the what we've all been talking about are the processes that are common that we use and are replicable to cause certain kinds of things to take place. So we have a process that's extremely replicable to get um, physicians engaged and participating. Um, 
one of the opportunities for, and uh, Pete has protocols about how things take place. One problem that we have in medicine is uh, we don't share those pieces of information. As, there aren't venues where there are places for us to share that, uh, and we often don't have common enough processes so that we can share across organizations. I think the work that's going on as an example around the common data model or around particular processes that the patient engagement groups are developing or that we're developing about engaging clinicians or that Pete's developing for managing particular things, that's where the gold, to me, that's where the gold is. There's a lot of people who are willing to contribute that and share it just like there are Wikipedia editors who are willing to uh, keep up on some particular thing that they're particularly passionate about. Um, and, and that has the potential to expand the capacity that we have really pretty d dramatically if we can harness it. There's tons of patients who are also doing exactly the same thing. That's what, Kat, that's what uh, Sally was talking about yesterday. Yeah, just, be, just from, from my perspective, um, you know, I think we have to understand um, the national um, gaps. Um, you know, what are the biggest value gaps in healthcare today at a national level? And around those, create some some focus and, and attention. Um, those I think are definable, understandable. Um, but if you're going to translate that down, I think if we're going to translate that down from a national level to a local level, it has to address the question of of value. And I think there are national there are issues at a national scale that need to be solved. Um, I think it's defining what those are, making them clear, and then making the connection back down in terms of the value that can create, not just nationally, but, but at a local level. I wanted to add just real briefly, I think we need to focus on the greater good, and I think there are a lot of you in this room that are already doing that. Um, you know, these things that are the best practices can't be considered proprietary. And if it's competitive and it's proprietary, um, that's why information doesn't get shared. And we are seeing, you know, the Wikipedia style and um, when the patient groups presented on an open PPRN. Um, Genetic Alliance has this entire wiki of, I think it's 2,000 pages of information publicly available. So that spirit is what we really need to focus on. So it's Kat have, Catherine Newton over here. I don't know if you've seen me waving my hand over yeah, here. Yeah, and we have two people on table too, so. Okay. Why don't you go and then um, you all, uh, it, first of all, you guys wanted to comment on this, right, directly or these new questions? I want to and, and yours, is it a new question? It's, in, it's really in follow-up to something that was a bit ago. Yeah. Okay, so Sally, why don't you go because you're going to comment right on this and then we'll go to you. And then, okay. I just wanted to um, bring us around back to uh, evidence-based practice and guidelines because I think one of the things that we did with the American Academy of Neurology was really rather interesting. Uh, they asked us to take their guidelines for epilepsy care and deploy it into the um, patient population with epilepsy and see what their reactions were to the kind of care they were getting um, in, in, and was it consistent with what the guidelines said. And we learned a lot, um, so did the AAN, um, that a lot of uh, the care that was being delivered by neurologists across the country varied quite a bit. Um, it varied uh, a lot once you got below the level of, a, of an epileptologist, um, so that there were two key findings, though, that were especially disturbing. One was, even with epileptologists, uh, one of the guidelines is, is that you discuss uh, contraceptive control with your patients who are on anti-seizure drugs, and they were really woefully low on that. And the second was just discussing the potential for surgical intervention, again, woefully low. And we know that in epilepsy that uh, patients who are, are assessed early on, as early on as possible, we can determine whether or not they might be a successful candidate for surgical intervention. Uh, one end of one experience of this that was just fascinating to me, and I just love to tell the story, was one patient who had learned about epileptologists, never heard of an epileptologist before, um, had epilepsy for 30 years, found out that um, she could get a referral and, and have uh, an assessment by someone who might know a little more about her disease. She found out that she was a candidate for surgery and has been seizure-free since. So, you know, it's that sort of knowledge base that we aren't tapping into and how well are these guidelines being utilized? I mean, we know that that's individually put into practice <clears throat> across the country. Patients can tell us, you know, if we just need to ask. We just need to put them out there and say, listen, tell us how this is going for you in your care and then we can start doing some research on why those guidelines either aren't being well utilized or understand maybe the guidelines aren't the right guidelines. Maybe patients need to weigh in better on that. So, thank you. Okay, and, then, and then you'll be next. Yeah, hi, Catherine Newton from um, Group Health in Seattle. And I, I want to go back to Bree's, I, 
great comment about speed, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, and I, I've been really thinking a lot about it because I think it's, it's important. And it occurs to me that we have a dissemination plan that is prestige-based rather than patient-based. And what I mean by that is that, so it's best for our promotion if we get our trials into top-tier journals. So maybe we go to a top-tier journal first, but then it doesn't get there. So then we go someplace else, and it can take a year or 18 months till our publications are published. We're asked in our NIH grants to have a dissemination plan. It seems like a silly question in a way because there should be a standard way for dissemination. It would, be, it would be a logical thing to have a lean process to dissemination versus us making up these dissemination plans. What do we say? We're going to publish and we're going to go to our academic meetings, right? And some of us get more creative than that. But this is, this is what we say. Um, peer review can take a really long time and I've, I've been in peer review situations where we've been asked to reanalyze data, where it was so obvious that we could have analyzed it 18 different ways and we would have gotten the same result. But, you know, there's something going on there in terms of, ooh, this way is better than that way, where it's really pretty meaningless. Um, results are embargoed because there's, we want the big deal, you know, the big release, which is, again, I think, a prestige-based a prestige notion in a way. Um, we wait to present our findings at meetings, or we're told we have to wait. And, you know, there's this debate between when can we present at a meeting versus when is it coming out in this important journal. And it seems to me in, in this time and age there are some trials that are important enough and this could be determined at a funder level where we're not going to play that game. Where what we're going to say is this is important enough that there will be a very fast dissemination plan that will get out to our patients and practitioners as soon as they need it. But then that hurts our promotion, right? Because if I get it in the New England Journal, it looks better than if I do this other way. So I think that process is broken. And this probably will annoy some people. but. Um, it, it, it seems to me we have a broken process in terms of, you know, it doesn't apply to every study. You know, I do some menopause research that it's probably not going to change much if I have to go through it the traditional way. But with, there are some studies that rise to the level of to re-examine this. Thank you. Uh, David Ballard with uh, Baylor Scott and White Health. So, uh, Buzz Stewart and I were talking before the session this morning about one thing we're really missing in these discussions is uh, perhaps some of the more uh, entrepreneurial business models that some healthcare delivery organizations have been engaging to try to get uh, their best practice models to the market. And so this question is really probably for the two Peters who do a lot of work outside their organization to understand what, what, what are the uh, formal business models that you might be engaging. So a couple of examples, uh, you have Cleveland Clinic franchising their, uh, their cardiac surgery model. They're essentially selling states to healthcare delivery systems, pay uh, $400,000 a year for five years, and, and you have uh, all the direct-to-employer uh, cardiac surgery cases in Texas, for example, uh, connected to the Cleveland Clinic, uh, linked to their model. Or you have uh, uh, what Earl Steinberg and uh, 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 Glenn Steele have done at Geisinger with XG Health Solutions, a uh, venture capital company coming in with $40 million. Geisinger owning 42% of that company to get their solutions to the market. So I think we, we really haven't talked about that at all over the last day and a half. So uh, could you talk about what are the, what are the business models that, that you two have, have pursued related to uh, moving from your organization to the world? and uh, what thoughts do you have about that? Yeah, um, yeah I'll speak to that. So uh, today, as an example, we are the fourth largest vendor of retail clinics in the country through our fast care brand. Um, we work with local health systems. Uh, they operate them. We, we actually have uh, contracts with retailers around the country, so the only way to place them in those retailers is through us. We're about to launch our national employer strategy platform and sell that as a franchise licensee model. 
what we do, and I, I had to go through it very quickly, but back to that new product development. Actually, if and that was based upon um, a benchmark research report on uh, new product development, which is a, a process that system that we've now implemented. But <clears throat> we have uh, a number of people in our organization who are out every day looking at the market for opportunities and gaps in services or services that we could be doing better than somebody else. Uh, they might be whole new services. They might be extensions of existing products. We, we vet those out and then we launch them into that um, process that I, I showed where new product development breaks out down into new products, product revision, incremental, or price and promotion. So we have uh, then a detailed structured process for each of those lanes to help get those products or services um, uh, launched and protected. Um, is one of the big issues with a lot of this stuff is if it gets buried into your existing financial reporting, people get very scared to launch new innovative ideas, so we protect those. So we've, we're trying to build a system that searches, identifies, and then launches. Things like our robotic surgery, um, we're going uh, regional. I don't know that we'll go national with that, but we'll go certainly beyond our traditional boundaries with that. Um, so we're, that, that's how we're approaching a very structured, disciplined approach to identification um, and definition and then uh, launch and incubation. We're, um, we're taking a little bit more of a nonprofit approach uh, because the networks that we run are actually involve participants from lots of different organizations. Uh, the model is uh, based on uh, what's known as lead user innovation. So uh, Eric von Hippel's work at uh, MIT and collective, um, collective innovation, uh, which recognizes that uh, if you get a community of people participating in a, around a common purpose, that around 15 to 30 percent will start to produce innovations that uh, anticipate the need of the rest of the community. Um, so with a, with a large network, uh, pretty much every week we're approached by all kinds of different uh, people from within the network and from outside the network who have an idea that they'd like to see um, that they think might produce some value. Uh, we also use a formal uh, uh, design and prototyping process to put uh, new ideas through um, a series of prototypes and pilots taking advantage of the diversity that exists in the network um, so that different sites uh, who have different, that have different characteristics might participate. That also produces champions in the system who, once the tools are working, can uh, serve as the champions as it gets distributed into the whole system. And we're starting to be approached by a variety of different um, uh, disease-specific groups and industry interested in learning about how to do this. And it's, uh, causing us to think a lot about how, how to uh, scale that kind of uh, system up and make it more widely available. So you do this in the context of a 501c3, a single 501c3 uh, organizing this work? Uh, we do it in the context of a network that includes multiple medical centers and a 501c3 working together, but with very complicated uh, money flows. Again, it looks more like a kind of Wikipedia type of uh, organization. Good morning. Audris Polakaitis, University of Illinois. I'm curious about this, the comments that were made um, on several occasions about the dissemination of research findings. I can't help but think about the line of business I'm in on a daily basis. And perhaps it's a little bit of a mundane example, but Microsoft, unfortunately, every once in a while discovers some fundamental um, problems with their operating systems, some breaches from a security perspective, and they release these things called critical patches. And then when you're managing an enterprise environment and you've got 900, 1,000 servers, they release it um, on a schedule, and then you have a choice to make. And the choice you have to make is, do I believe that Microsoft got it right? And I'm going to take this patch and blow it out across 900 servers. Or am I going to wait and let some other people take the patch first? And let's hear whether we hear scuttlebutt about this patch wrecking things 
and then we'll do it later, right, after somebody else has experienced the challenges. And it's always a hard decision, um, and most organizations develop sort of their internal strategy for better or for worse about this, but fundamentally what you're doing is balancing the risk against, I guess, the reward. Um, <laughs> the reward being fixing a problem Microsoft had to begin with. So, so I, I guess now I'm thinking about it, outside of the personal um, advance, advancement of your own career, so I'm waiting for a, a, a journal or an invitation to a, a great opportunity to present the work, are we not also talking about something here that is, do we not have to be a little bit careful about something comes out and how do we really know? Uh, I, I think even sitting here with Dr. Thomas and we were talking about the MRSA um, study which, which his organization was heavily involved in. And he asked sort of this, this question at the table yesterday. Uh, so have your organizations adopted this? And, and how do you know that just because it worked at one set of organizations, it would actually be effective in another set of organizations? So this seems to be a complicated, uh, a complicated risk uh, reward kind of balance and conversation in this. So any, any thoughts from the panel? So I I have a couple thoughts, and if, if you're wondering if something works in a small setting, I encourage you to think of the opportunity through PCORnet. Why are we doing research in, you know, 10 cases or 100 cases when we could be doing thousands and millions? And so I think that's, you know, the paradigm shift. Now the opportunities that we see, we can all partner and study things in a much more broad capacity. I also would ask, um, as you're thinking about the research findings, if you remove the benefits of, um, you know, prestige, prestigious um, publication for your career, or, um, you know, some type of financial incentive, why would you be sitting on that information otherwise? Is that the right thing to do? Is there, what are the really good reasons for not releasing it? Um, and I think we should all ask that. I don't know, I, I keep coming back to, um, I, th I think that to be successful at executing, uh, there is a, a rhythm that an organization needs to establish in, in, a, in a discipline. and. You're right. Uh, we deal with complex issues. Um, decisions need to be made. Um, I think what we're interested in is creating the structure and infrastructure for those discussions to happen, for priorities to be made. And I can tell you in our organization, once a priority has been decided upon, the organization is all in, meaning everybody in the organization who needs to contribute to that. And, and when I work with organizations, um, maybe getting off topic a little bit, but um, so I have a I have a good idea, um, and it's really a good idea, and I think it could improve care. And I need help from um, five other departments or clinics within the organization. And I get on the phone and I say, uh, you know, I got this great idea. Can you help me with it? Sorry, I've got my own great ideas. Yeah, that I'm working on. I'd love to help. Your idea is really good, but I've got my own. So the um, the question I think that that we need to ask: What type of infrastructure or structure have we created to deal with those difficult questions and issues, and to develop our priorities? But then, to, once we've made the decisions, that the entire organization, top to bottom, gets aligned around those priorities and um, is is aligned to make it make it happen. And we are going to make uh, wrong choices. We, we, we do that. Um, but that's the rhythm that I'm talking about. We understand quickly we've made a bad choice, and we adjust, and we recalibrate. And that's, that's a structure, and that's a rhythm and discipline um, that I think organizations um, need to develop. It's, it's not, in my mind, it's not a question about making perfect choices every time. It's about how we align and adjust to the choices we're making. And quite back to the other question, there, there's really good work now on um, uh, scale and spread and dissemination. I, I agree, I think I heard that we shouldn't have to figure out every time we're, we're going to disseminate how we're going to do that. There are good um, methods for doing that and probably need to just understand what they are and say this is what needs to happen uh, to disseminate information. So... John, okay, so here's the cue, Rich, John, John, how's that? Rich, John squared. Okay, so uh, Richard Platt, I, um, I lead the PCORnet Coordinating Center. In a couple of weeks, um, Rob Califf, my 
co-director colleague and I are going to spend an hour and a half with many of the NIH Institute directors, and they're very interested to know how uh, they might engage with PCORnet once it, uh, it, it emerges from its planning stages. And I'd like to make sure that we carry the right message from you all. So this is a question for the panel, but also for everyone else from the room. Um, I expect that a couple of things that, that we'll hear, at least from many of the directors, is uh, first of all, they see their current clinical trial model as being broken, and they desperately hope that PCORnet can provide a new mechanism for doing many of the kinds of trials that NIH is interested in doing. The second thing that I think they'll say is many of the things that NIH is interested in are upstream from, from, the, uh, from the primary interests of delivery systems and the things that uh, have quite appropriately been surfaced as the, the things that are, are mission critical for, uh, for many of your institutions. And so I think they're going to be interested to to know whether there's a possibility of developing a partnership to do multi-center studies quickly at lower costs than they do now, to address topics that I think everyone would agree are important but won't change practice tomorrow no matter what the result. So I, 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 I just want to make sure that um, uh, when, when, when we try to reflect the views of, of PCORnet, uh, the PCORnet partners, that that we give uh, a, a reasonable answer to, to those questions. And as I say on talk radio, I'd be happy to take your answers off the air. This isn't something I need to know when I walk out of here today, but I would like to, like to have as, as, as uh, nuanced a, a way to respond in a couple of weeks. Can, can you clarify, Rich, one of your points, and I'm not, I'm not sure I heard it correctly, but um, <clears throat> It has to do with why are we doing studies that won't change practice anyway? No, won't change practice tomorrow. Uh, okay. That, that is, NIH is, uh, in, in the scheme of, uh, of, of, of uh, a, a national agenda, there are topics that are, uh, that are ready and need to be evaluated in, in clinical environments. And yet they're not ones where once you know the result, we'll say it's time to disseminate. So, uh, I, and, and there are, and, and that's what we ask NIH to do. We say, uh, bench to test in bedside to going at scale, and and there's there's a space there where where where, where NIH says um, it's critical to do these studies. Um, the model they have now is one that they see as having a, a limited future, where they, at great expense, build a, a, a network trial by trial, and then they take it apart and start a new one, their great hope is that PCORnet can be an important part of a, of a new paradigm. Um, and yet, some of, the some of the topics are ones that everybody would say, that's great, we're, we're, we're all in for that. But some of them are going to be ones for which I would guess um, um, everyone would say, that's important for the nation to be attending to now, but it's not a priority for our organization this year. So, uh, so that's that's the, uh, the the question that I'm. I I expect will be much on their minds, and I'd like to have best best uh, answer for for them. I just, you know, the chairs, the moderator's not supposed to say anything about, but I'm going to anyway. Um, I would say that there is a role for dissemination in those types of research findings. It's just who they're disseminated to. And I would say that those types of trials, the results should probably be disseminated to other researchers to tee that research further down or to other funding agencies. Um, but I would agree there are different points in time where you disseminate to end users yep. in expecting right. a change in practice. Right. Um, so, but I would just, I just, just to be clear, I think they want to know how, I, I, I guess to, to put a sharper point on this, how should NIH engage with, with you folks, the PCORnet partners, now, so that in a year and a half or two years, there will be the kind of understanding and collaboration that would allow NIH to bring to PCORnet the kinds of questions that are important but aren't mission critical today for, for your delivery systems? 
Okay, so John, I, no, no, you're the third John. Um, so John Steiner's first, John, and then you, David, you were next, and then, and then if you all can do that in five minutes, we're good. If not, <laughs> you know, I, Rich has raised a question of sufficient importance that I'd actually defer to see if anybody wants to try to address that first. Does anyone have a comment directly related to Rich's question? Um, I think you opened it up to the entire um, room. Yeah, if yeah. I, certainly, the panel is well well versed to to deal with it. But I think everyone in the room has a uh, has a piece of that answer. So Jonathan Tobin has his hand up. So um, uh, Jonathan Tobin, Clinical Directors Network in Rockefeller University. I think one of the unique opportunities that PCORNet has is to look at the organizational and clinician level measures that are um, embedded and interlinked with the um, uh, delivery of services that may be important causal variables for understanding variation. Uh, the final plots that uh, 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 Peter, you showed before, who's doing the best, who's doing the worst, are probably as much related or perhaps more related to those variables than they are to individual patient level factors. And so if we think about the cascade of dissemination and implementation from the standpoint of understanding and explaining that variation, one very prominent role that PCORNet can play is to really monitor the downstream implementation of the innovations from clinical trials supported by NIH and to begin to understand the interaction of those patient and organizational and clinician level variables and understand how they can be modified in a way to produce better results that for the organizations and the healthcare systems help them understand the kind of variables. Uh, uh, Peter Knox, you were talking about ar around internal operations, but at the same time advance the generalizable knowledge about dissemination and implementation and lead to our ability to uh, accurately assess the public health impact of the NIH and PCORI investments in clinical trials demonstrated in really a, a large kind of phase four monitoring system. Right. I, I mean, I, I don't want to hijack the conversation, but uh, so you'll shut me down, Jean. Uh, um, are, are you I'm doing gonna, that now? I'm going to ask, Joe seems to want to make a comment on this, which um... All right, thanks. Um, uh, I, I wanted to add to what Jonathan said and, and maybe give a, um, a little bit of a um, PCORI perspective that has a lot to do with why this meeting is happening. If all went well uh, 18 months from now and we had um, systems working with the uh, lead uh, researchers at the CDRNs and with the patients of those CDRN populations involved in governance and decision making, um, they would most certainly entertain the trial ideas of the NIH and other funders, but the NIH would need to expect that there would probably be some pushback on their ideas because many of the ideas that NIH funds uh, aren't uh, really very disseminatable to anybody, even to uh, other researchers. So uh, we would not want to see a system that's simply for the sake of surviving and staying funded accepted trials that were not uh, in the patient's interest to participate in or the system's interest to participate in. So we would hope that uh, um, uh, the CDRNs in, uh, within PCORNET, and I think it would vary, I think the readiness and the interests are going to vary across the CDRNs as a function, among other things, of who are the clinical specialists involved at particular CDRNs. It will also probably vary a lot if we have a PPRN that's very interested and weighs in and says this is an important idea. But not every idea that comes from NIH, uh, we would ex not expect every idea that comes uh, from the minds of, of an NIH scientist to be attractive to CDRN sites. And on the other hand, um, I think we should be really ready to engage with NIH in, in discussions about what is a relevant trial. Okay, so um, John, do you still have a comment? Yeah. Uh, I do. Um, oh, oh there, which, you, do you want another John? There, <laughs> there, it no, gets there, very confusing. There are three Johns. And okay. There are three Johns. 
Who are you um, calling on? <laughs> I'm calling on you because you were in my blind side. So you get to go and then John White. Well, it is a bit of a change, but one of my hobbies is, is trying to identify general psychological uh, issues that underlie a lot of these discussions. And, and listening to this for the last hour and a half, I think one of the issues that underlies this is the need for control. And, you know, we exist in a system where, where researchers have sort of perfected the art of controlling the agenda, uh, as Catherine so nicely described, by, by limiting access to information until such time as the researchers finally think it's, it's okay to release it. Um, I, I think what the panel has done is to point out uh, that uh, other groups have legitimate interests in that information far earlier in that process. So this can either become a battle for control, which wouldn't benefit anybody, or by changing how, really, I, I talked about governance, and I really do believe in governance to the extent that, that one of the solutions to this is a change in how the governance of research takes place. And simply by getting organizations and patients or members at the table early in the process, I think we're, we're fundamentally redesigning the governance of research in ways that are going to address this sort of problem. Because Bray, I can't imagine you standing for me saying, I can't release this until I get to present it at a national meeting. That would be a very painful discussion for me to, 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 to hear your comment. But by getting you at the table early, I think th those are actually creating the circumstances under, under which the traditional control of researchers is unlikely to endure. And that's a really good thing, but governance is actually Thoughtful governance is a way to assure that, that, that th at least the battle for control is made uh, more explicit. Okay, last comment, um, John. It's, it's 10.45, you have 15 minutes for a break, so. Yeah, um, let, let, me, let me just try to get it out quick. Um, so <laughs> I do have an opinion on how NIH does this, but I think it's probably better form for me to tell them directly since I'm within the federal government. So I'm not going to answer Rich's question. Um, this discussion of dissemination and it, 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 we were talking about the benefits and the risk. Rachel's question teed up for me greatly in my, great in my mind. Um, it, and then it, if all of a sudden it was like, wow, that's clinical practice. That's sitting in a room as a clinician, sitting with, you know, a patient across and talking about, you know, yes, we, I think this particular drug or the surgery or whatever is going to help you, but it's also a risk that it's going to kill you or, you know, right, that, that felt just to me like clinical practice. So what, you know, this talking about, well, when do we pull the trigger and when do we make it go? Yeah, there's organizational decisions, but why aren't we just putting that information in front of the clinicians and the patients and let them talk it through and let them weigh the risks and let, let them decide? And that's that's patient-centered. That's, right, you know, kind of at, at the essence of it. So that just the discussion about when do we get the information out there. I will add, though, it, the point about peer, believe me, being at ARC, I understand this issue about peer review and how long it takes to get stuff out. Um, I will just add that there is a, um, a regulatory function to that system, okay, which is the volume of stuff that comes out. So it's fine to take that regulator off the spigot, but boy, you better have a you know fire ready to put out with it because that's going to be a lot of information. So you just we need to think about better ways to do that. That's it. Thanks. So I'm sorry we've taken you. Um, out of your break for a couple of minutes, but I think this has been a very rich discussion, and please join me in thanking our panelists and everyone in the room. And, and before, before the panel uh, gets up, I, I would like you to have one last parting shot, if you'd like, because I think what the question that Rich asked, we, this is a section on culture, and do you have any advice to those of us in the audience who are researchers about the culture of research besides uh, speed that really frustrates you when it comes to learning healthcare systems. I noticed that Pete, you had four spots where you thought research could play a role, so you're very strategic about where you put it. Where does it get in the way of systems trying to advance? Uh, at, at dinner last night, uh, no concern about cost came up uh, uh, from from our dinner table conversation. That that's a candidate. Or are there any others? I can only speak 
you know, probably for our organization, um, it gets in the way when it takes energy away from the priorities that we've identified as an organization. And uh, we're, we're very clear about this. And, and again, we have this rhythm and, and routine. And we will have heavy debate. Uh, but if, if we don't accomplish certain things in, in a time frame uh, that is possible, then we've, we're taking energy away from other things that need to be done that are important to patients. This, this is all about managing energy in our organizations, something that's a limited supply. So if, it, if it's aligned, it's, it's so absolutely necessary. If it is unaligned, then it takes energy away from, from the organization and things that, that we need to do. And I, I can only speak at the local level. I would, would also just add that, um, you know, I, and it's difficult to do, but I, I just keep wondering what would happen if we truly, truly put the patient at the center. How would we act? How would we govern? What decisions would we make? Uh, and it's very difficult for us. We, we're constantly challenged by our patients to think about um, how we make decisions and the time frames in which we make decisions. I think it would change um, radically how we, we think and act. Any other comments, Peter or Ray? This, to build on what Pete's saying, I think we should be aware of 50 or 60 years worth of research that's focused on the concept that people call co-production, which is this idea of how, how we actually organize uh, systems around the participants. Um, there's, and I think we ought to start to inject some of that knowledge, which comes from trials and in other fields, that can really inform how we work uh, with uh, all the participants in new ways. And uh, I think there's a big opportunity there that we're overlooking in healthcare right now um, because of lack of familiarity. So um, I would just say that, yes, this is a huge investment in energy. I think all of us involved um, in PCORnet, maybe we didn't quite understand what we were getting into. But um, I think we need to see it through. Um, and I think once we get the infrastructure in place, it's going to be less painful. And we have to stop you know, this wasted resource um, on research in this country where we, we rebuild, we take apart, we start again, we go back through all the same things with recruitment or retention. How do we find patients? We know they're out there. Can we connect them? Um, I think the initial investment in energy is absolutely going to be worth it if we make it sustainable. If we all kind of half-heartedly do this and we take, you know, whatever, and I know it's not full funding, but you take this money now and then you go away and you don't bother to sustain this, then I would just say, you know, what are we doing? That's ridiculous. So right now we need to all commit and say we are changing the culture. Um, we're not going to be doing uh, what Sean Tunis would call patient-centered research, that we really are committing to patient-centered research and multi-stakeholder collaborations uh, to improve the entire research infrastructure for our country. Well, thank you all. And, and I do uh, want to echo Jean's uh, statement that culture is really important. And, and understanding the two cultures, I think, is going to be critical to our ultimate success, as you say. So let's take a break. We'll reconvene at 5 after 11. <laughs>